All right, I'm back with another video, again, recording from a hotel room, so it's likely to not be the best sound quality, but probably won't be too bad. Okay, so it looks like this is the last section of sort of going over the basics of integration theory and measure theory, and so after this, we're going to start getting into the actual, or start getting into the meat of stuff that's unique to probability theory, so that'll be exciting. But first we have a few facts, and these are mostly things that you can find in Falland, I think in chapter 6, maybe? Um, but yeah, so here's a pretty um, not too difficult fact to prove. Um, so the infinity norm, or the, yeah, the infinity norm of a function f is, if you're in a discrete space, this ends up being um, just the maximum value that f can take on but of course it, we're in measure theory so things that happen on a set of measure zero don't happen or don't matter so you end up taking the the infimum of the maximum over or take the infimum of numbers such that f is greater than that number only on a set of measure zero so, for example, you can have a function which takes on the value infinity, but um, the measure of the set where it takes on infinity must be... Well, then the this, infi this infinity norm could still be infinite. Anyways, so this is just the definition of the infinity norm, and we've got to prove this inequality. Okay, so... Not a good start. Choose, so a good starting place would be let's choose any m, which is uh, included in this set over which we're taking um, this infimum. So let m satisfy the measure of all points where f is greater than m. Why am I using... Okay, G. What we really want is we're looking at G because we're taking the infinity norm of G, the L infinity norm, whatever. Okay, so then what? We can write the integral of FG d mu. We can always break this up into the integral over the set where, well, f is either going to be, or the, the absolute value of f will always either be less than or equal to m, or greater than m. So let's break this up into these two different set, sets. So we integrate over the set where f is less than or equal to m, fg d mu, and then we add the integral over the set where f is greater than m, and fg d mu. And of course, I made a mistake, because this shouldn't be f, this should be the set where g is less than or equal to m, the set where g is strictly greater than m. And why do we do this? We do this because we know the set where g in absolute value is greater than m is a set of measure 0. So the second integral here will evaluate to 0, because you're integrating over a set of measure 0. So this is simply this first integral. Um, and so we have the integral overall set where g is less than or equal to m of the absolute value of f times the absolute value of g. Well, we're taking the integral over the set where g is less than or equal to m. So if we replace g in absolute value with m, then we end up with a less than or equal to here. So we just make this m d mu. And so, this is precisely m, well, this is certainly less than or equal to this integral, because here, all, so we pulled out the m, and then we integrated over a larger space, and integrating over a larger space, or integrating over a larger set will only increase the integral. Okay, but this is precisely m, times the one norm of m. All right, so this, in, this integral is always less than or equal to 
m times f. And this holds for any m which satisfies the measure of the set where, where the norm of g is greater than m is 0. So if we, taking the infimum over all such m yields the integral of f g d mu, because if we take the infimum, the left side doesn't change, and on the right side, we get the, well, the, um, the one norm of f will be a constant, so that won't matter. The only thing that changes is we end up multiplying by the infimum of all m, such that the measure of the set where g is greater than m in norm is zero. But this is precisely the infinity norm. So this is f1 times g infinity. And so that's all we have to prove. And so this is sort of a straightforward exercise, but it's a good way to get used to working with these problems. If you have to do a problem involving infimum, well, maybe try, or if you want to have an inequality involving an infimum, Try to prove the inequality without the infimum, and then take the infimum. And so, yeah, that's how you do this exercise, and we're done.